my name is Cam Donaldson. I'm Pro Vice Chancellor of Research here at Glasgow Caledonian University, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this latest in our series of professorial lectures. This is a series that uh, reflects the, the public role of, of universities, which for GCU as the University for the Common Good is about how our research and teaching contribute to the Sustainable Development Goals issued by United Nations in 2015, running through to 2030 and applying and adopted by uh, all countries. And today, uh, with a focus on equipping the next generation of fashion talent to make the industry more sustainable, the emphasis is on SDG 12, responsible consumption and production. Although, as you'll see, several SDGs will be touched upon, especially those most closely related to the environment and to equality. Professorial lectures represent a, a, an opportunity for, for recently promoted and appointed professors to, to showcase their, their previous work and their future plans to colleagues, to other stakeholders, as well as to friends and family. And the, Natasha has with her uh, at home today, her husband, Tommy, children, Babette and Bo, uh, and joining online her parents, uh, her sister, old and new friends, colleagues, students and peers from across the globe who I know, both individually and collectively, uh, continue to form the most amazing support team for Natasha. You are all most welcome, whether you're watching right now uh, or a recording. I would also like to thank Natasha for being one of the most enthusiastic colleagues for taking up the opportunity to present her professorial lecture online. So to Natasha herself, uh, Natasha came to us as Professor of Marketing and Sustainable Business based in GCU London and the British School of Fashion. And she'd previously held several appointments at different stages of career at the University of the Arts London which included time working in Hong Kong. And in Hong Kong, Natasha also worked at the German Swiss International School and the Hong Kong Design Institute. She has also worked at New York State at Via Maria College in Buffalo. Natasha's cross-disciplinary research spans creative industries practice, sustainable fashion, social enterprise and responsible business, cultural heritage, consumer behavior, and international fashion marketing. This work has been recognized in many ways. Uh, Natasha is a, a National Teaching Fellow, Vice Chair of the Costume Society, Editor-in-Chief for the Bloomsbury Fashion Business Case Studies uh, Journal, uh, Co-Author of Fashion Management, A Strategic Approach, and winner of the Case Centre 2020 Award for Ethics and Social Responsibility. She's a member of the steering group of the Prime UK and Ireland chapter, and Natasha's esteem has been further recognised through many awards for her teaching and research, as well as panellist and speaker invitations to prestigious academic, industry and social events. Just this year, Natasha made the shortlist for Marketing Scientist of the Year in the Women in Marketing Awards. Today, Natasha is going to outline how a collaborative approach to teaching and learning is vital to ensure fashion professionals can create a positive impact and drive lasting change in an industry whose glamorous facade often conceals its negative environmental and social impact. So please join me in welcoming to the floor to present her lecture on greening the fashion industry, how higher education can deliver sustainable development, Professor Natasha Radcliffe Thomas. Hi, thank you very much. Thank you, Cam, for the introduction. I'm going to share my slides now and jump straight in and um, I'm looking to talk for about 40 minutes and then there'll be a chance for a bit of a conversation so do um, send some questions my way please. So I'd like to start with some thanks. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction Cam. Thank you to Professor Gillies for the opportunity to become Professor of Marketing and Sustainable Business at GCU. I want to thank the whole gang at GCU London, even though we're working remotely and I miss you all. Um, and to thank family and friends who, many of whom are joining me um, today. And I, and I feel that, so thank you very much. Um, I want to 
set the, the lecture in the context of um, you know, what a professor does. This is a, a public lecture. And I know from the confusion when I invited people to my professorial drinks that not everyone actually understands what a professor spends their time doing. And so I've made this uh, little pie chart, really trying to reflect the different types of activities that I get involved in um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So I love teaching and my teaching has really been informed by my research. And so research and teaching really form a kind of strong link. And as part of um, you know, developing your curiosity and, and finding about the, out about the sorts of topics that are really relevant for your students, you make a lot of partnerships. And so professors work you know, in the classroom, we work writing and, and scurrying about doing research and we also spend a lot of time reaching out and especially in fashion which is really an, an applied um, subject linking in with industry and through my many years of experience I've developed specific interests in the areas that you can see on the slide here so I've always been really interested in the sort of global aspects of fashion and also of education and my interest in, in marketing has also encompassed sustainability, hence uh, the topic today. Um, you can see me here on the slide looking very pleased with myself. I, this was taken last year when I was in Guangzhou. I was kindly invited to the Guangzhou Academy of Fine Arts, where we, I was working with students and academics talking about fashion, sustainability, intangible cultural heritage. Um, and as Cam said in the introduction, I've been lucky enough to spend time living internationally. So I'm based in London, but I've had the opportunity to live and work in Hong Kong and the States. And whilst those opportunities have been fantastic in terms of opening you know, my eyes to lots of different experiences, you also see through your travels, the negative impacts that the fashion industry has. And when I was living in Hong Kong, one of my kind of abiding memories is actually of things like the air pollution coming from factories in Southern China. I remember when I was working in the States, going on a student trip to you know, the garment district in Manhattan and seeing how basically skills were being lost. And we have the same um, you know, in, in the UK. So these are the sorts of topics that I'm going to be covering um, in today's talk. I'm going to take us through a, a quick um, spin through some of the negative social and environmental impacts of the fashion industry. I'm going to talk you through some of my own kind of research interests around fashion and intangible cultural heritage, how that intersects with the concepts of sustainable development. On a more positive note, the research that I've done on sort of purpose led businesses and then how that all ties together with this idea of educating for sustainable development. And it's good timing to be looking at this because this is the week for um, you know, pushing education in sustainability. So it's really come at a good time, my lecture, I hope. So I really love fashion. Um, I actually work at the British School of Fashion based in Fashion Street. Uh, my Twitter handle is Fashion Natasha. So I am all about fashion. I really love the positive aspects. I'm a maker. I'm a designer. Um, I love how fashion, you can express your creativity, your identity. You make friends through fashion. It's a really um, fantastic industry with a really glamorous image. One of my ways into fashion was a bit of an obsession with fashion history, and I'm still involved with the Costume Society. And you can see on the slide here an image of Twiggy in the 1960s, and it's the sort of thing that I would be fascinated with as a kind of young teenager. And it's also the 1960s of the time when the UK high street really, um, you know, leapt into life, and, and London specifically was the centre of sort of, you know, of the of coolness for fashion. Um, Moving on a few decades, the other image on the slide you can see is the, from the 1990s and really the era of the supermodels. And it's kind of from this time onwards that fashion itself became extremely fashionable and all sorts of other industries became involved in it. Plus the model you know, became bigger with um, mechanization, with globalization, fashion kind of took over the world and became the really massive sort of multi-trillion dollar industry that it is today. But as Cam said in the introduction, beneath a sort of glamorous facade, we find ourselves in this moment in time, most of the headlines are not about glamorous supermodels, but they're actually about the negative environmental and social impact of, of the industry. And so, you know, 
in the UK this week, we've been hearing about, you know, the threats to retail jobs. We've been hearing about um, the, you know, fast fashion and these terrible sort of Black Friday sales where garments are, are virtually given away and the scale of that. And we're also this year, you know, you'll be aware of the impact of the pandemic in terms of the lockdown and retail closing and the negative impact that had on cancellations of orders, you know, specifically on the slide here, you can see an image from Fashion Revolution talking about the orders that were cancelled for factories in Bangladesh and the, and the terrible impacts that that's had. So how have we sort of got to this situation? Well, one of the organisations I worked with um, and I'm a great admirer of in Hong Kong is Redress. And on the slide here, you can see in some images from them where they really work to educate designers um, and students around the negative impacts that are built into the predominant supply chain for fashion. Now, it's really interesting to me that today's conversation around fashion is, as I say, less about glamour and hemlines, and it's more about supply chain, because really in the past, that would have been a topic that only people that are really interested in, in buying and fashion management would have discussed. But you can see from the slide here, the idea of linearity that goes from you know the textiles that, that clothing is made from, all the different processes, shipping, retail, consumption. And at each of these stages, there are impacts both on the environment and socially. And just recently, we've been starting to try and account for these. So you can see some um, statistics on the slide here from red carpet, green dress. And the sorts of things that go into our clothes, you know, the materials uh, require a, an awful lot of energy and resources. So if we think about um, maybe say a pair of jeans or something, jeans are made from cotton. Cotton is a crop that needs to be um, grown, uses a lot of water. A lot of water is used in processing, production. We don't often think about actually shipping goods around the world, um, but, but materials, the, you know, the raw materials and the finished goods get shipped around the world, adding to kind of carbon impact. Um, then our usage of them, which has really gone down. So in general, a lot of people now hardly wear their clothes before they're kind of cast aside. And extremely disappointingly, a lot of clothes actually end up in landfill. And you, you can see from the slide there, this horrible statistic about how a garbage truck of textiles is either burnt or sent to landfill every second. And we can only imagine the negative impact that's having and the absolute waste that's built into that system. So this is something that the fashion industry itself has been talking about over the last few years and the business of fashion reports here um, you know talking about how fashion is you know looking towards making progress but it hasn't actually taken its environmental responsibilities seriously enough and a lot of um, you know industry watchers and consumers themselves are saying the time is is now is for action not just talking and so we're kind of ending up with this situation where you know fashion and industry that I really you know love and want to be part of is as it says on the slide here it's lost its luster and just this year as well earlier in the year several luxury brands came um, under scrutiny in a New York Times piece looking into artisans in India who were making you know doing the beautiful bead work and embroidery for you know Parisian luxury houses but actually working under terrible conditions with you know negligible labor rights etc and sometimes we think of these kind of social issues as being in another part of the world to us you know if we're removed from manufacturing we don't really think about this as happening you know close by but we in the UK know that just this summer we had a, a, a lot of scandals based in factories in Leicester so these sort of environmental and social issues are happening across the world they have more impact in some parts of the world but it's not something that we can um, feel proud about escaping from anywhere and it is something that we need to face up to Another issue that may not kind of seem so severe as some of the social justice and environmental impact issues, but also is really part of some of the systemic problems um, in fashion is this idea of cultural appropriation, which really 
it's a tricky one for fashion because anyone who um, goes to design school is using inspirations and looking around the world and looking at artworks and looking at techniques and looking at colorways and using them to kind of inspire themselves. But what happens with cultural appropriation is when someone kind of takes um, a technique, a design and recreates it without attribution or without actually um, you know, payment, let's face it, for the artisans from where that came. And you can see on the slide here an example, which was one of the first times that a, a designer brand actually got called out for this practice. And you can see the Mexican government actually lodged a complaint against Carolina Herrera for basically using an embroidery design without attributing it and without you know working with the artisans who are responsible for that design so um this idea of intangible cultural heritage actually ties in with sustainable development because it's about recognizing the value that uh, is intrinsic in cultural practices we often and think about in fashion of, of cultural practices as being a sort of historic thing but the idea of intangible cultural heritage is keeping traditions and skills alive and it's interesting because when we take from other systems or take from other cultures and don't recognize the value in that we're really devaluing the whole system and it's interesting that positive luxury who um, work accrediting uh, luxury brands um, against their sustainability credentials this year in one of their reports are talking about this idea of redefining value and I think it's something that a lot of people have thought about during this kind of pandemic lockdown situation is actually what is important and what are we valuing and a lot of people who previously weren't involved in making have taken up hobbies whether that be painting or knitting or, or stitching and have actually sort of really enjoyed that creative piece and seen the the pleasure of making things with your hands but sadly in the industrial fashion system that's not something that has been valued recently when i was living in hong kong i was lucky enough to um, work with a shanghai tailor and learn how to make chi pao a lot of the technique is by hand and it's a tradition that's passed down you know specifically from shanghai tailors and but one of the things that's been really sad in the kind of industrialization of fashion is because these processes can be mimicked by machines and, and produced in production lines, we've sort of devalued the hand skills. And so in Hong Kong, as in other parts of the world, the skills inherent in something like tailoring are dying out. Apprenticeship, apprenticeships, you know, systems are falling away because the, the money is not there and it's, it's hard work to become that so this is one of the things that i've been interested in looking at in terms of my research is this idea of kind of situated creativity and how you know the skills inherent to specific designs and techniques kind of build and can add a positive value to um, a location and so i've investigated uh, tailoring both men's and women's in hong kong um, and in Shanghai and actually in London. And in as part of my research in Hong Kong, I came across an interesting organization called um, Bonham Strand Tailors, where there are luxury tailors, but it's built as a social enterprise. They discovered that a lot of the tailors in Hong Kong were elderly, were underemployed, and were working in um, you know not great conditions. And they kind of scooped them up and put them into a, you know work collectively in a you know a beautiful studio doing the skills there you know they've trained for building in apprenticeship schemes and also working with a local community and helping to rehabilitate um, people so it's been a, a really an interesting example to, to find out of a sort of business that's set up for profit but it's putting the social um I suppose the social as social care aspect of the tailors and looking after the people who are the at the heart of the industry. My interest in tailoring, as I, said, I also looked at in London, and I mean London, as you'll be aware, is really the centre of the world's tailoring industry. And somewhere like Savile Row has still has not itself escaped the kind of problems of you know mass manufacture. And so for brands like um, you know businesses like Gives and Hawks at Number One Savile Row that I, I worked on a research project about 
for them, uh, equally, they face this challenge of how to keep young blood in the industry, how to compete and how to kind of, um, I suppose, show the quality inherent in the skills, the materials of the garments that they're creating. And so, but something like, uh, um, you know, Savile Row really is a great example of responsible production, looking after people that work for you and with you, respecting materials and making quality products that can last a lifetime. One of my other um, personal interests is vintage fashion. And it's something that I was interested in investigating internationally. I've looked, um, I've investigated vintage in the UK, in Singapore and in China. And here on the slide, you can see um, the lovely Julia, who is the founder of Anata Vintage, which is a, a vintage store in Shanghai. You can see from the slide there that, that you found it by going down a little alleyway. Super interesting. And it exactly as it says there, you were at the end of an alleyway and you took 89 steps and then you found you came upon this little treasure trove of a vintage store. A vintage fashion is one of the areas that we're seeing a lot of growth in at the moment. And it's one of the kind of more, again, sustainable answers for fashion because it's about valuing things from the past, reusing and re-wearing. And so it was really interesting for me to look at the kind of cultural aspects of vintage and see the similarities and maybe the differences between vintage happening in different parts of the world. And that's something you know, I've explored over a few years. Um, I mentioned cultural appropriation and sort of this idea of culture and sustainable development um, earlier. And it's one of the recurring themes. I mean, I, I looked at this aspect when I did my um, doctorate several years ago. Um, and I was looking at one of these, uh, getting ready for tonight, I was looking at one of the articles I'd written and I, I picked up this quote about product novelty. It's something, if we think about the Western notion of creativity in very broad brush strokes, we often want novelty, we want new things, and fashion is really guilty of this. There's been a massive speeding up of the seasonality of fashion, and you know, the more and the new and the new and the new. And this sort of take make waste has sort of almost been built into the system. And I'm really interested to, to investigate other sort of fashion systems and see whether this, you know, how this is the same, how this is different, and also in looking at how people's creativity and contributions to fashion are valued. And on one of the papers I, I worked on, on that's um, mentioned on the slide here, the new Shanghai Shaoje, looking a few years ago now at the chi at Chinese fashion industry. And I was very lucky to work um, with my lovely daughter Babette on that paper. So it's nice memories looking at that on the slide there. So having looked at some of the challenges, having looked at some of the areas of my interest, how, does fa how do fashion and sustainable development um, tie together? You probably are familiar with this visual by now because the sustainable development goals, as Cam said in the introduction, have been around since 2015. And they're a collective global set of sort of aspiration, targets and aspirations to help end poverty and to work towards a, a fairer and a better society and environmental conditions. Now, clearly, the fashion industry could touch on a lot of different areas of sustainable development, but I've highlighted a few of the goals on the slide here. One thing that often um, occurs to me working in fashion is it's a very female <laughs> industry. And so gender equality is one of the um, SDGs that touches fashion, whether that's at the beginning of the supply chain, where we often have um, you know, female workers not being paid very well and not having labor protection and et cetera, or whether that's at the other end and the kind of boardroom where women are underrepresented. So there are definite gender equality issues around that. And we can think about that in, in retail um, as well as in production. But also this idea of sort of economic growth and what is good work. So we've seen that the fashion industry has grown enormously. But with that growth, it has not supported decent work and the growth of the industry has not been fairly distributed and it has not respected the environment or kind of um, all people basically and so you can see again 
As Cam mentioned, SDG 12 around responsible consumption and production is one of the SDGs that we often think about with fashion because of this sort of more specifically around the fast fashion industry and the idea of overproduction, the negative impact on you know rivers through dye dies run it die runoff etc but also the the wastage that we see at the end of the system where a lot of the world has has got so used to having cheap clothing it's become disposable set aside all of the sort of horrible chemicals that can either be part of the fabrics themselves or just go through the processing and so lots of those sort of impacts you know can have negative impacts as you can see life on land life below water and the carbon the massive carbon footprint of the fashion industry that we've been talking about a lot this summer um, obviously has negative impacts on the climate so it's important when we're thinking about trying to build a, a more sustainable um, fashion system that sustainability development is the kind of pathway towards sustainability and that we need to recognize the human side the kind of planet side but also it's important to recognize that fashion is a business and so we need to think about the kind of commercial side as well and that to make sure that we're having not only quality but sort of fairness within the system and underneath the SDGs. So there's 17 SDGs. There's a lot, as you can see, of targets. And one of the ways that the SDGs have been sort of, um, I guess, sold to, to, fashion, to the fashion industry is the potential actually for releasing value. And you can see there on the slide that uh, the SDGs could potentially uh, release an enormous amount of new business value. But on the other side of the slide, you can see in the image from Extinction Rebellion, who are reminding us that if we don't do something and take uh, you know, the, the environmental impact of the fashion industry seriously, there won't be any planet to, you know, to enjoy our fashion on. So that's a bit of a, a negative point to, to leap into my next section. I am an eternal optimist. And so in terms of my um, research, I've always, often looked for who's doing good work. I think it's great to find examples to share with students and actually even just yourself to feel good about the industry that you're working with. And undoubtedly, we are in a new era for fashion um, in for the fashion industry, where a lot of businesses are leading with purpose. So I'm going to talk through some of the um, businesses that I, that personally I've done research on. And I and in doing this research, I've worked with a lot of partners. Um, so thank you to everybody who, who's helped with this. Tom's is one of the first businesses that I looked at and I worked um, with my friend, Dr. Anna Roncher. We did a, a longitudinal international study on the work of Tom's. We were intrigued by them. If you're not familiar with them, they started as a footwear brand in, from California. And the founder, as many social entrepreneurs do, didn't actually start with the idea of having a shoe brand, but he saw a problem, which was children in South America not being able to go to school because they had they didn't have shoes and thought because he was an entrepreneur, what could I do through business that would actually help remedy this situation? So he created the brand Tom's, um, which was a buy one, give one brand. And over the years, it became a giving brand in a whole range of different categories. And you can see from the quote on the slide there, we make shoes and eyewear, but really we're in business to help change lives. And at this point, they've um, donated 95 million pairs of shoes to children. And in the case study, we look not only at their, you know, their business model, how they measured impact, but also the sort of critiques of this type of model, um, and so the, and the cynicism that often came um, comes along with businesses trying to work through purpose. Another brand that you're probably familiar with and who are very well known as being sort of leaders in the area of responsible business are Patagonia. And so I worked on a case study on Patagonia with my friends at Rosemary Varley and Bill Webb. And again, they're one of the sort of leaders in terms of um, reimagining what a business could be. They've been very open about 
the fact that that every activity and every business has an impact but they've been one of the businesses to try and turn you know to reduce impact and also start to have a positive impact they've also been leaders in things like founding the sustainable apparel coalition um, and working collaboratively with businesses investing in research and development in um, new materials and then sharing that knowledge with other uh, members of the fashion industry so that they can you know, work alongside each other. Another couple of things that are sort of, they're notable for, you can see the ad there, don't buy this jacket. They've questioned the whole notion of consumption, of business growth, and they've also really worked um, on repairs and introducing you know, that idea of, you know, buying things, valuing them and keeping them for life. So they've been really interesting to look at from those aspects. Stella McCartney is another brand Really interesting um, innovator, just picking up awards at, at British Fashion Week um, this week. And I worked on a case study again with my friend Rosemary Varley, looking at how Stella McCartney has used her own personal sort of activism, her own values around things like vegetarianism, and then taken that into a luxury brand. You can see from the image that has the sort of green heart um, on it, Really interesting, a couple of years ago, she did a marketing campaign where she took her collection up to um, a landfill, so to a rubbish tip in Scotland and shot these beautiful luxury garments on lovely models lying amongst the sort of detritus to really you know, bring the world's attention to what we are doing to the planet. Um, she's worked, as she, when she was part of the Caring Luxury Group, she really pushed them to introduce environmental profit and loss accounting uh, one of the results of which was they realized the the enormous sort of impact of using virgin cashmere and invested in developing sort of recycled cashmere and she's put a lot of um, energy into supporting you know alternative materials that can that can be used sort of vegan materials and just this year came up with her a to z manifesto this year we've seen a lot of designers rethinking um you know their positions rethinking their activities and in her a to z manifesto a is for activism um, and so then another much smaller and actually a business that I came across on Savile Row. When I was doing my research on Geeves and Hawks, I was on um, Savile Row and I bumped into Nancy, who you can see on the slide here, she's the founder of Tengri. She herself has been inspired by the Patagonia business model. And when she um, was traveling in Mongolia, was really struck by the inequality inequality between the people at the beginning of the cashmere supply chain in Mongolia and the sort of luxury industry and customers at the other end of the supply chain and she's worked with um, again in a social enterprise with yak farmers in Mongolia to build a model of um, you know a really good socially environmentally responsible business and came up with the concept of yakshmir where the, the yak farmers actually use the, the fibers from grooming their yaks and that makes beautiful fine fiber which can be woven into amazing textiles or knitted into beautiful garments um, and, and has also looked at the whole business model to ensure that people can be supported to reduce the land degradation that you know was happening in Mongolia but also to help the um, you know indigenous people and the herders to get land rights and to celebrate their um, cultural heritage and so a really you know fascinating case study again linking across from Mongolia to the UK from the sort of yaks on the you know in, in Mongolia to the woolen mills that she works with in the UK uh, and then the end products and so now bringing me into the, the home run, the, the meat of the thing, how do we take all of this knowledge, information, um, interest into higher education? How do we educate you know, our young fashion industry professionals into ideas of global citizenship and sustainable development? There's a lot of words on that slide. Um, this is something I wrote an opinion piece for clothing cultures a couple of years ago about why I had decided you know, to take a personal responsibility in um, developing more responsible sort of fashion education. I've worked more on the business side of fashion education in the last few years. And 
it really wasn't being, you know, the idea of business models, the idea of cause marketing and purpose weren't, you know, wasn't central to the education. And so one of the decisions that I made, I felt a huge, it's a huge privilege to work in education and I love teaching. I'm also a lifelong learner, which is why I'm always reaching out and trying to find out new stuff that I can put together. And, and then also thinking about teaching. Um, I've got a great network of educators and people working and learning and teaching. Think about how do we bring these things across? And so I really felt a personal responsibility to bring sustainability into the core of um, fashion business teaching. And this is sort of the context that I saw. This is a few years ago when I was thinking about developing curriculum. You know, there is a growing responsible business sector as we've seen. The idea of a future fashion career has to be about sustainability, whether we think about that as a planetary necessity or actually a strategic move. There's such an increased demand for sustainability expertise in the industry. Um, a certain, to a certain degree, sustainable fashion is the news. I mean, you know, sustainability is fashionable, which is, you know, it's not great in one sense, but let's leap aboard it. People are interested in it. Students are more interested in ethics and sustainability. They're asking more questions about an industry, you know, that, that they're going to be working in. And also we're thinking about how do we teach for sustainability? Are there different models that we need to embrace? And so the concept that I came across in my sort of teaching research was this idea of sustainability literacy, which really resonated with myself. You know, this idea of students being able to um, build an argument, understand these. It's not about transmitting facts. It's not about reciting a list of negative impacts, but it's really about being able to put your own personal values to work, to understand some of the systemic issues and then also the individual actions that we can take. Um, and so in terms of building a curriculum, it's been really important to me to think about both the local and the global, to really understand what responsible business could be and to think about how to deliver that in a transformational way. And one of the ways that I've done that and developed that is through working with case studies, looking at the sorts of examples that I've showcased in the you know, previous um, parts of the talk, but then also thinking about how we actually learn. And one of the things I'd be really interested to do as well is to break down the kind of formal classroom arrangements to, to develop more collaborative learning and also to take this in a sort of um, global and also transdisciplinary directions. So on the slide here, you can see four of the cases that I mentioned in the purpose-led business. Working with case studies really gives you an opportunity to think about decisions that have been made and for students to embed themselves and take on roles within a business to question. So you can see for each of the cases here, for Tom's, you know, you're thinking about, it's a huge actual business. Should social enterprises be for profit? There's a question looking at sort of some of the course marketing, looking back to some of their early marketing, is it exploitative of the very people that they're trying to help? What are, you know, the business ethics that they're abide by? How do they enact them through business? And how do we deal with ideas of consumer cynicism? If we're looking at something like, you know, Patagonia, I talked about innovation, the anti-growth collaboration, someone like Stella McCartney and the environmental profit and loss, you can really investigate what does that mean? And what does it mean to be a fashion activist working in luxury? And someone like Tengri, a much smaller scale business, how are they creating value and how are they reducing things like textile waste? So really interesting questions that you can you know, engage students with because it's sort of, it's not what happens, it's like what could have happened, it's, it's asking what if. So another responsibility, I think, I suppose, in, in all of this is, how, is to share your knowledge, to learn from other people, as I mentioned, and also to share your experiences. So again, I've been really lucky to, with my colleagues, uh, and you can see a lovely sketch there by Beatrice of myself and Anna talking about teaching with uh, case studies at the um, Chartered Association of Business Schools Learning and Teaching Conference a couple of years ago. Uh, you know, I'm part of a huge network of international fashion institutions. You know, I work with the um, principles for responsible management education and at Bloomsbury Fashion Business Case Studies to kind of showcase how we can address this and to learn from other people. And then also to think about interesting ways to enact the teaching. So one of the big projects I've been involved with recently, which was my National Teaching Fellowship project, was creating a global classroom within which students in 
um, all around the world, so from London, Vietnam, Hong Kong and Singapore could connect, could share their local knowledge um, and could also think about working in a, a contemporary and future fashion industry and, and what that would be like. And that really, that sort of global citizenship is something that's been really important to me. And then thinking about how we assess for sustainability literacy, thinking about alternative assessments. So um, a few years ago, one of the assignments I came up with was to develop a social enterprise. So students often are interested in business planning. And I just made the decision that if our students were going to make business plans, they would be for social enterprises. And the one on the slide here, Grand made, is still a flourishing social enterprise where um, the student actually um, worked with a brings together some grannies in India who are a bit underemployed and possibly a bit bored and they're knitting beautiful creations which are then sold to, to support them. So really interesting case there that you can look at afterwards. Just this year um, at the British School of Fashion, I've launched a module in sustainable luxury and which asked the students to interrogate the practices of the industry that they're going to be part of and also to uh, develop their own sustainability manifestos. And I wanted to come to SDG 17, just as I get towards the, the end of my presentation, because SDG 17 is about partnership. And I really um, you know, want to take the opportunity to thank many individuals, organizations who I've worked with over the years and recently to help push this sort of agenda forward, to educate me and to give me uh, inspiration in terms of businesses, in terms of communication, and also working with students and showing them some, you know, really positive outcomes. And a couple of people that I've worked closely with, are, um, I'm a fellow of the RSA, very proudly, and I've been very happy to work over the last year alongside the RSA and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation as they work to make fashion circular. And I really recommend that you, you know, if you're interested in this area, to have a look at things like the student awards, and then also to look at some of the current work they're doing about how we reimagine um, a fashion industry for more circular, less wasteful, um, you know, outcomes. And what's next? I think I'm just about getting to the end here. Um, what's next? At the moment, I'm working on a project with my lovely colleague, Dina Khalifa, and we've supported by um, a little bit of seed funding from Prime and also working in collaboration with Textiler, a, a, um, a media organization in London, and looking at this attitude behavior gap. So I've looked a lot more from the business side, and this side is really looking at people like myself who are interested in fashion, who are interested in sustainability, and why do we still have this gap between what people say they want to do and, and, you know, and what they actually do, what we actually see? Um, because in terms of, if we think about this year, as much as people have reflected on their own personal consumption choices and their own impact on the planet, um, we've also seen the sales of fast fashion go, you know, exp grow exponentially. So it's, you know, think, looking at some research there. So as part of that research, we've been uh, earlier in the year, we talked to attendees at London Fashion Week. We've been working with a whole bunch of lovely fashion industry experts, um, designers, commentators and activists to really try to unpack this and hopefully get some really useful policy outcomes. So a couple of takeaways just to finish with. Education for sustainable development is about empowering learners. It's also about lifelong learning. Um, it's a holistic approach. It should be transformational. We have to think about not just what we're teaching. We have to think about how we're teaching. Um, we have to think about the environmental integrity and a just society. And hopefully that, as it says on the slide here, if we're successful with that, we transform society. So that brings me to the end of the talk. I'd like to thank everyone for joining and end on a bit of a positive note here with this quote from the uh, Deloitte Global Millennial Survey, which as you can see says, millennials and Gen Zs know that a post-pandemic society can be better than the one that preceded it and they're tenacious enough to make it a reality. And I really hope to be a little part of that. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks very much for that, Natasha. I, um, I will allow um, Professor Donaldson to, to obviously pass on the congratulations and stuff, but well done on that. I'm sure everybody that's joined us today has enjoyed that. 
Um, just to move on to the, the question and answer session, um, and this is the audience that, that we have with us. Um, thankfully, some people have been submitting questions throughout the, the lecture, and I can see that number going up at, at the moment, and I will hand over to Lynn to put them questions to you in a second. But just for anybody who did miss the instructions on how to put um, a question to Natasha, um, at the start, you can use the Q&A functionality at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you're submitting a question on the chat facility, it won't be put towards Natasha. And depending on how many questions that we get, um, the Q&A uh, questions that maybe don't get asked will still be shared with Natasha. So if you are posing your question and there's a name on there, then we can happily share that with Natasha post event and she can, she can come back to you on, on her questions to that. So um, if anybody does want to, to submit their questions, it's very straightforward to do. Just click on the Q&A and you type your question. It does automatically add your name unless you click for it to be anonymous but it is nice for Natasha to, to hear who the question is coming from because she might know you personally or you might be one of her students. So um, I will hand over to, to Lynn to, to do some questions before we, we hand over to Professor Donaldson to, to wrap today's lecture up. Thanks, Julie. OK, so the first questions came in from Patricia Cook. If quality and classic styling were marketed as more desirable, should this not help reduce landfill and improve garment manufacturing conditions? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Absolutely. And I think we are seeing within certain areas of the fashion industry a push towards longevity through quality. And I think um, definitely for some consumers, that's something that they're really looking for. And it's also something that people think about when they think about clothes in the past and vintage clothing, because often, you know, maybe within our own living memory, we can remember garments actually feeling thicker and better, made of better materials. I think the problem is that a lot of us us have got used to having very cheap clothing and people as we know there was the famous documentary a few years ago the true cost and people disassociate the cheap prices from the actual cost in terms of environmental and social damage when they're buying those cheaper clothes okay thank you okay for the next one it, this is from titus natasha nothing noting that many fashions waste ends up in the global south developing economy in addition to landfill sites what are your thoughts on policy directives from the perspectives of the global north in controlling fashion waste and ensuring sustainable development? Thank you, Titus. Hi. I think, again, a really great question. It's one of the areas that we really need to think about extended producer responsibility and so what happens to the garments at the end of lifetime and and you're quite correct that a lot of you know a lot of the negative impact is unfairly distributed towards the global south there have been some initiatives taken to try to clamp down on this and ultimately what we want to do is is try to limit the amounts created of waste so that we're not having those to ship off somewhere because they're going to go somewhere but absolutely true to, to bring that up so thank you Okay, the next one has came in from an anonymous person. When large companies are relying on their shareholders for finance, what, in your view, is the best method to educate the shareholders? Well, one of the things that's been really interesting in doing, on working on the research that I'm doing at the moment is to find out that lots of people working inside fashion in businesses are actually really interested in pushing uh, for more su sustainability. And I think we're going to see, I mean, we're seeing this is in investment as well, that a lot of people are not feeling comfortable about investing in companies that have really uh, negative impacts and that, you know, tied to things like petrochemicals and, and, you know, those types of things. So I think we're going to see more pressure from shareholders, but also if we think about the luxury industry, for example, where we see leadership from, you know, big organizations like Caring saying, okay, this is a, this is a business priority for us and actually rewarding their, their teams for working in this area, that's going to help shift things um, but I think but you know we're seeing more green investment so hopefully that will expand to fashion as well. Next one from Philip Anthony. Hey, thank you for the excellent lecture Natasha. Do you think that mass fast fashion can continue as it has done in the past given the problems of overconsumption? Is it able to adjust to a buy better buy less approach perhaps? Yeah, another good question. I really hope so. I mean, I think what's really a shame is that in all the developments in technology, in mechanisation, in, you know, 
building these really efficient supply chains that the energy has gone has been extractive it's extractive not only environmentally but also financially and so you know in the week where we're you know we're seeing a collapse of the arcadia group and you read about you know where share dividends went and etc there there's, there are there is often money in these situations but it's going to the wrong people it's really unfairly concentrated in the hands of a few and even with you know something like the boohoo case early this year it might be naive to say but you do feel like could you not just have a better factory could you not just pay people um and just have a better business model Okay, thank you. Okay, the next question is from Terry Finnegan. How do you see the link between sustainability and equity um, as you are talking about a just society? Hi, Terry. Thank you for the question. I absolutely think this is, is really central. And as I say, it, you know, we get into these topics in different ways. And so one of my interests in that sort of intangible cultural heritage thing piece is really about how we value things. And often, you know, if we if we speak if we look at the developed in the Western world, it really devalues creative artifacts that come from other parts of the world, you know, in terms of the cultural appropriation and worse. So it's definitely, uh, I consider lots of these issues extreme, you know, social justice issues, where we look at where the finance is, where the money is, where the wealth is. Why do we have fashion billionaires? It's not, it's not right. Not while people, you know, are working under hideous conditions and don't have protection you know it's 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 wrong basically so yeah, i agree um a question i'm from james miller rhizomatic learning is not without its critics but it is a format that has many benefits would you regard the global classroom approach in fashion and sustainability that you have described as a form um as rhizomatic teaching that could lead to a better learning outcomes for students as well as being very effective in spreading the whole sustainability message yeah thank you great question one of the reasons that um i wanted to work with the global classroom and with and with like-minded colleagues around the world was really i mean i actually had this idea of cultural heritage and cultural capital in mind i often teach in what i would describe as a stealth approach so I didn't actually talk to students about that being central to the idea, but it was really about giving students in different parts of the world the opportunity to own their knowledge and to represent their own knowledge as, and also, um, you know, interculturality. It's extremely important for us to understand our own cultural lens that we put on things as much as to find out about other people's kind of cultural interests and so bringing students together and now, you know, some of us are on Zoom or whatever the whole day, it doesn't, it seems a bit okay everyone's doing it but in the past the limited opportunities to actually bring students together and i think that idea of being able to link through social media um, also breaks down a bit of the formality of the classroom and really builds communities of practice so it's definitely something um you know if you're doing it with your pedagogic hat on and you understand why you're doing something then i think it can be extremely effective okay um, next question is in from Anne priest given the rush back to consumption post covid lockdowns is there a role for legislation to ensure only sustainable products are available? Thank you, Anne. Hi, hello. Yeah, great question. I think there's definitely need for legislation um, in terms of limiting things, but also I think we need to support better initiatives. I mean, it's been really interesting to see that in Copenhagen Fashion Week, they're now putting a whole set of criteria for their next Fashion Week round where brands have to sort of meet these criteria. And I think, again, where we see business um, models like B Cause, for example, as Patagonia is, let's reward businesses for doing good work rather than just be punitive but i definitely think you know with the time for um you know just letting things be and and hoping for the best and i also think it puts an enormous responsibility i both on small businesses but also on the consumer i mean not everybody has time to think about transparency indices although they are you know fantastic and it's really great that we have so much more information out there but wouldn't it be nice if we could you know get back to thinking about clothes and fashion in a, in a more positive and pleasant way without having to to worry that our consumption choices are you know negatively impacting all around thank you um, i've got two questions and from iqbal so i'll just put them together natasha what mythologies have you used in shanghai for your research and then the next one was how do we convince consumers towards responsible fashion consumption 
Okay, well, in terms of methodologies, I do quite a lot of serendipitous research, which is a term I learned from um, Sally Brown, who's uh, I'm a great admirer of. So quite often I'm wandering about and I see something and I, and I wonder something and then I go and have a nose around and find out about it. But when I was, uh, some of the work I've uh, in, in Shanghai, I was really helped by my daughter, Babette, who's a Chinese uh, Mandarin speaker. Um, so she helped me root about and find out, uh, you know, written sources. But a lot of things, as I say, I'm a lifelong learner. I'm really curious about things. And I often wonder, oh, I wonder why that is. And uh, but also, I mean, I'm a quality, I have a qualitative approach. So I also do, you know, field research. I like to interview people. I like to understand what makes people tick and, and what they think about. And I can't remember the next bit of the question, sorry. Yes, okay, I've just deleted that bit as well. Anyway, I'll just move on to the next, sorry. Um, so Bill has asked, you're doing great work, Natasha. For me, the key is in your what's next slide. How can we start to treat consumers and students as individuals, not assembly line clones? What future do you see for collaborative co-creation of fashion? Tesco is selling me seeds now to grow my own veg in an allotment during lockdown. Yeah, thank you. Great question. I mean, one of the things... Um, you know that I think education has a, a, a real part to play and is not immune from some of the practices that we see in big business. Um, so the you know the industrialization of education, for example, has is, is not been a, a positive move. So I think you know where we're working to be partners with our students to um, you know we're not trying to fill them up, we're trying to to work together. And I I suppose you know, that's, that's a positive future that I see. I actually saw, you know, a few years ago now that the students that were coming in have a, a lot more developed sense of social justice and a sense of purpose and are talking about wanting to do good in the world. So I think we've actually got a lot to learn from our students. And a lot of the time we're maybe just opening doors and asking the right questions and, and bringing the right connections together. I've also found, you know, as I said from my thank you slide, so many people are out there with a lot more knowledge and experience than myself who are really willing to partner with students and to, to bring them on. So I, I do have hope for a more positive future. And I also think, you know, that you know, taking things into your own sides and into your own hands and, and kind of practicing what you preach. I think that, you know, this area is quite a, um, an emotional one. It touches people's values. And I think when we try to live our values through our studying and through our work, then hopefully that leads us in a, to some positive outcomes. Thank you. I think we've just got time for one uh, last question before we I pass over to Professor Donaldson. So I'll take from Beth Ann. Natasha, first a big bravo for a wonderful talk. My question is, what do you personally still want to achieve in the future? Oh gosh, Beth, and that's a really um, <laughs> big question. First of all, thank you. Um, I I think just keeping doing what I'm doing, working um, in a globally responsible way, celebrating my students' um, achievements, and working with great colleagues and partners as I as I do. So I think sort of a bit more of the same, maybe a small cup of tea after this. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thanks, Lynn, uh, for for hosting that uh, that discussion. Um, I mean, in both my roles as UNIS chair and pro vice chancellor of research, Natasha, I just see I have lots of questions, uh, but just see lots of potential for uh, really exciting collaborations across the uh, campuses and across the, the the university. But don't worry, folks, that's all. That'll be a discussion for uh, for for another day. Um, but I'm really looking forward to it because I really do genuinely believe that there, there's, there's just so much uh, in, in your talk in, in, in that respect with, uh, in, in relation to uh, such great potential for, for future research collaborations. In the meantime, though, I, I mean, I honestly don't know what to say. That was just so uh, inspirational, uh, so typical of... of uh, what we're trying to, to achieve and aspire to at, uh, at, at the University for the Common Good and as has been littered throughout uh, your talk in terms of um, our aspirations for addressing the, the sustainable development goals and it just it just remains for me just to, to, to thank you for that and for finishing this calendar year's uh, professorial lecture series on such an amazingly uh, positive note in terms of uh, what you have achieved, uh, what you're doing right now, but probably more than that, uh, the, the, uh, what you hope to achieve and the hope that that gives us 
uh, for the future. So thank you very much. Thanks to the audience. Sorry we didn't get to all your <laughs> questions. And uh, the, 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 my, my own comments are, are merely reflective of, of what is now coming through in, in the chat function as well. Uh, uh, universally uh, a, a, a tour de force, Natasha. Thank oh, you very much. Thank you. That has been great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for joining. Thanks, Thank folks. Thanks, Enjoy Sam. the rest of your evening. <laughs>